This is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online and I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you for joining us for this special talk with yoga therapist and author Robin Rothenberg and the topic of our talk today is uh, working with prana keys to enhancing health and vitality and we're especially excited to have Robin here to talk about that. Robin is an internationally respected yoga therapist and uh, she's really been a leading pioneer in working with the therapeutic applications of yoga for various health problems. Most notably, uh, she created the first protocol, I believe, for uh, the, one of the largest studies on uh, yoga for low back pain and also wrote a book on that topic, um, the Essential Low Back Program. Um, today, Robin is here to talk about her latest passion, which is breathing and uh, more specifically healthy breathing and how it impacts our body. And Robin, you spent, I believe, the last uh, year focusing on that topic, uh, researching it in preparation for writing a book on it, which comes out later this year, which we're extremely excited about. So I'd like to first start by taking a step back and looking at the concept of prana, which is kind of a yogi concept that may not be so familiar to a lot of people. But when we look in different cultures, most cultures have this concept of a life force or vital energy that flows through body and mind and which is the source of our energy and vitality. And in Chinese medicine, that is referred to as qi. In yoga, it's referred to as prana. And pretty much any culture has this idea that there is a life force energy that lies at the root of our well-being. Is that your experience understanding as well? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, uh, even in uh, when I was doing my spiritual direction training and I was learning more about um, the Jewish perspective on it, there's this beautiful term ruach, which means both breath and spirit. And even espiritu in Latin refers to the spirit and the breath. So there's this idea that breath is very much linked to our aliveness, right? And to that animating force within us. That said, I do think that a lot of people, certainly I can speak for myself, um, it felt has felt that that is somehow a little esoteric, a little mysterious, a little hard to really grasp. Um, like, how do I manage my prana? Like, you know, there's this idea that with yoga, our yoga practices are intended to help us master our prana. And so that we become a reservoir of prana. How exactly? How do we do that? And it's more specifically, pranayama is, is the tool, the primary tool that yoga offers for doing that. And of course, there we have that direct link between the breath and this energy. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I talk about in the book is that the word energy is as close as we can kind of get in English to prana, but it's really not, it's not a, a, a straight line. Um, especially the way we use energy in the West, where we can say, oh, I'm just kind of low energy, or he had bad energy, or, you know, right. I didn't like that energy, or whatever, you know, like we use it in a variety of ways. What are we really talking about? Um, at the same time, there's really nothing in English that encapsulates this um, elemental flow, because prana is very much linked to the elements. Um, just like qi is very much linked to the elements in Chinese medicine. There's this sense that when the elements are balanced, mm -hmm. then there's health, let's say that. And when the elements are out of balance, there's disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the fascinating things about the concept of life force energy is that it's sort of the underlying common denominator that determines the general state of our health and energy and well-being. So 
you know, the idea is if you find ways to enhance life force energy and facilitate the flow of vital energy in your body, you can not only enhance your day-to-day well-being, but also possibly help prevent disease or manage disease better. Sure. And of course, um, you know, the yoga tradition contains many, many different um, approaches to working with prana and most specifically breathing techniques or pranayama. So um, what is the basic idea of how we can work with the breath, how we can help facilitate the flow of prana in the body by working with the breath and facilitating uh, healthy breathing. Yes, absolutely. So um, there's, there's basically two primary um, avenues for doing that. One is the biochemical piece, which is balancing our CO2 and our oxygen levels so that we are more oxygenated. And the misconception there, the most common misconception is that to become more oxygenated, what we need to do is take more in, take more air in. Mm -hmm. Um, The fallacy there is that there's only 21% oxygen in the air we breathe. We cannot get any more than that from the outside and we don't produce oxygen on the inside. So we're not meant to have more than that. That's what we're meant to have. So it's not about getting more in, it's about being more efficient with the oxygen we take in. Mm-hmm. And the other half of that fallacy is that this idea that oxygen is good, getting more oxygen is good, and getting all our CO2 out is also good because CO2 is toxic and bad and it's you know like poison or something. It's actually, an incredibly important element for our health and we produce it. We actually, the CO2 that we need, we can't get from the outside, even though there's too much CO2 in the environment for the environment in terms of supporting our CO2 needs. um, There's only 0.4% of the air we breathe in that's CO2 and we need more than that. So we have to produce it. And that's part of this pranic equation. We, it, CO2 is a byproduct of activity and movement. So one of the ways that we can support our prana is by moving. And of course, the more we move, it affects our breathing. But regulating our breath so that we retain the CO2 that we uh, are creating, producing through movement is very important, which means breathing lighter and less as opposed to more so that we're containing it. The, the, the connection between CO2 and oxygenation is that oxygen dis, is distributed into the tissues only in the presence of, of a, a normal amount of CO2. So when our CO2 levels go down, we can breathe in for, forever if we could, you know, but it wouldn't actually enable us to be more oxygenated. In fact, the harder we breathe, the less oxygenated we are because we're breathing out the CO2 we need in order for the oxygen to diffuse into the tissues. So the biochemistry is one piece of it. The other piece, which isn't unrelated, is the biomechanics. And that's where we get into where are we breathing from? How are we utilizing our respiratory system in conjunction with our musculoskeletal system? Uh, Because the Diaphragm is a muscle, but it's also, you know, a vital part of the respiratory system. And so how do we work them together to also maximize efficiency? And that is a huge, has a huge role, um, not just in our, in terms of our breath. Mm -hmm. And this is the piece that's so why I went down the rabbit hole of, and fell madly in love with the diaphragm is when I started investigating the biomechanical piece Um, for my book, which I didn't expect to be as interesting as it turned out to be. Um, And I just like, (laughs) like literally just found myself just enamored with this, this structure, this diaphragm that is, it it coalesces so much of our, of our vital organs. There we have vital, vitality, prana, right? Our vital organs, the diaphragm, uh, I think you said it 
before when we were just chatting about this. It's like it's it's this it's this eternal massage masseuse within us that's massaging our you know our liver and our spleen and our intestines and it's bouncing the heart above it and 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 the lymphatic system and the nervous system and the arterial and the vena you know the arterial system the aorta goes through it the vena cava goes through it like it it's quite phenomenal right in the center of our body and it's structurally linked to our abdominal uh our deep abdominals our transverse abdominus and fascially linked to our pelvic floor up into our neck, into our jaw, into the structures of our neck and, and throat and our nose. And so it's breathing and the central um, pump of the diaphragm, this pranic pump of the diaphragm are very intricately linked. So if we are, for instance, chest breathing, which a lot of people do, and breathing using our accessory muscles up above and disconnecting from the abdominal muscles in the pelvic floor, which are supposed to be engaging with, in time with, in sync with, in rhythm with our diaphragm, what happens is we get out of sync with ourselves and there's less action right in that central, you know, part of our body. Uh, and so we don't get that lovely pranic pump happening to the fullness that it's intended to be. And I know I say this in, whenever I'm talking about the breath, and I'm hoping that by repetition, everyone will learn we breathe 15 to 20,000 times a day. If we're healthy, if we're unhealthy, we actually breathe 20 to 30,000 times a day. But the, the, the actual, the quantity of that movement, I think helps to, for me at least, it helps to remind me why it's so important that we breathe well. Because it's not something that we just do once in a while. It's happening all day, all night. So if it's, if it's optimized both biochemically and biomechanically, the likelihood of us being healthier, having more prana, being clearer of mind, it, it affects every system, the functioning of the brain, everything. So mm -hmm. it's huge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting point because, um, you know, we... We don't. We think a lot about keeping our muscles fit and all the, you know, keeping aerobically fit um, and taking care of all, you know, the different parts of our body, the digestion system by eating well. Um, but when it comes to the organs and the diaphragm, it's sort of like a part of the body that we're not really in touch with, and it just kind of sits there. We never really think about it as something that may also need movement, may also need, um, you know, kind of the stimulation that causes, that facilitate blood flow. Um, so it's really interesting that you say that about the diaphragm, that it's not just an apparatus of breathing. It is also, it, it has another role in terms of uh, creating that subtle movement inside the abdominal region. Yes, it's, it's also, um, I've got a couple things that I'd like to share around that. One is um, it's a primary core stabilizer and people don't realize that. I, don't, I, 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 I knew that on an intellectual level, but I didn't really understand it until I started looking more deeply into the studies that have been done looking at functional healthy breathing and core stability and they go together and and i i have a lot more to share on that but um it, it, there's no doubt that if people even if they are um, apparently healthy people and active people if they are not breathing in a biomechanically optimal way, that is they're more chest breathing or their mouth breathing on, on a regular basis, they have less core strength than people who actually breathe abdominally, ab abdominal but diaphragmatically, right? So they're engaging their abdominal muscles in sync with their diaphragm um, each and every breath in a consistent way. Um, so that's really important information for those of us who are yoga practitioners, yoga teachers, yoga therapists. And which leads me to the other piece, is, which is um, my training and the way in which I was taught about how to teach Tadasana 
um, had a, was a, there was a lot of focus put on where the pelvic girdle was, the positioning of the pelvis, and where the shoulder girdle is in relationship to the pelvic girdle. Is that mm -hmm. similar to you? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, other things from the feet all the way up, right? But mm -hmm. in terms of the torso, kind of goes, you know, like if you're going, you know, the shin bones connected to the knee bone, right? It goes the pelvis and then the shoulders. <laughs> as if there's nothing in between. Right. Now, as a result of my research and as a result of the practices that I've developed and worked through because of that research, it's completely transformed the way that I teach Tadasana, which means every pose. And instead, I'm looking at the positioning of the rib cage and the functioning of the breath around the rib cage as the actual, like, if, if that's centered and balanced, what happens is the pelvic girdle and the shoulder girdle are aligned. Mm. That's what happens. And it creates that link between posture, movement, and breath in a functional way so that the core stabilization is there. The breath is in a, in the diaphragm is in an optimal position to move as it's supposed to move. And so therefore the benefit of all of our movements is going to be amplified. Very interesting. And I just yeah. want to say my students and my, the, the teachers that I train have found it to be equally revelatory. So it's not just me going, oh, isn't this so cool? And people going, yeah, whatever. No, I mean, I, I'm getting, I get the feedback like that's just changed everything. I can't believe how different it is to think about my alignment first and foremost in terms of where is my diaphragm, you know, where, where is my rib cage positioning mm -hmm. my rib cage? How am I breathing? And then work above and below from there, like work mm -hmm. from the center out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, continuing that exploration of the importance of diaphragm, and uh, in a moment I want to go to how we can work with keeping the diaphragm healthy, um, but um, another area when we are exploring how the diaphragm plays a lot more, or has a lot more importance than we have considered before is the vagus nerve. The yes. vagus nerve runs through the diaphragm, and could you talk about how that connection is? Right. So the vagus nerve is a, a very important part of how the brain gets information from the body about our felt sense, like how how we're doing on that more internal um, way. Are we? Are we agitated? Are we scared? Is our, is our gut up in knots? Are we relaxed and you know, chilled out? So, and the brain will react based on the information. So it's interesting because the vagus nerve, um, there's a lot, a lot of networks for the vagus nerve that run right through the diaphragm and into the, the gut, into the enteric brain, um, the enteric nervous system, which is sort of our gut sense of how we're doing in the world, which is why people feel a lot of um, sensation in their gut at times of high excitement or fear or trauma or whatever might come up on an emotional, big emotions. Oftentimes people feel it in their gut. And we even talk about the gut sense of it just didn't feel right, um, mm -hmm. that premonition. So that's the vagus actually. That's the vagus talking to us. Mm -hmm. um, the vagus also has a lot to do with social engagement. It wires up into the jaw and into the ears, into the lips. Um, and so it has a lot to do with what's happening right now. You're looking at me, I'm looking at you, there's eye contact. Um, you know, you, you give me some cues that yes, you understand and you're nodding and all of this is also the vagus. Um, that helps to calm our nervous system down. We are social creatures and we're always reading our environment um, to give us a sense of whether we're safe or not, safe mm -hmm. or not safe. And the vagus is one of the ways that the brain gets that information. Um, and one of the things that I just recently um, discovered is that the vagus has more afferent um, uh, nerves. Go so the, the, the pathway isn't equal brain to body, body to brain. It's 80% body to brain. Mm -hmm. So it really is, in its intention is to give the brain that felt sense information so it can make choices and decisions about what we should do because 
this is what's happening out in the world. So mm -hmm. breathing, we know that when we get stressed, what happens to the breath? Right? Short. <laughs> and when we get relaxed and chilled and we're having a good time, what happens to the breath, right? Okay. So that, our, that felt sense and, and the breathing go right together, which is why breathing can help us to move out of a state of agitation and anxiety. Because as we change the breath, we're actually changing the messaging that the vagus is getting and therefore is sending to the brain. And then the brain's, the thinking process shifts and goes, oh, I guess it's okay. Right. She's breathing like it's okay, so I guess it's okay. Mm -hmm. So I just want to share um, that because we're talking about prana, the yogis were on to this. You know, we've got all these, you know, fMRIs and, you know, we get fancy diagnostic tools. So now we can have this kind of conversation. But the yogis back then, they just paid attention. And, 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 and their little motto was prana follows chitta and chitta follows prana, which is to say the, the breath follows the mind, the mind follows the breath. They wag each other's tail. So we can change our mind. We can change the activity of the mind, the agitation of the mind by changing the breath and vice versa. It's always going on. And the vagus now, of course, they didn't probably know vagus nerve, but we know vagus nerve. And so now we're understanding more of how that mechanism works, right? Mm -hmm. But they were onto it. They knew. Yeah. 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 And it's, um, you know, such a, I mean, it shouldn't be a revelation or anything new, but we are used in the West to thinking, I mean, we're all experienced how the mind uh, impacts the body when we're nervous and we start, as you said, breathing faster. And when we get stressed out, the whole body gets in a state. Um, but the fact that we can turn it the other way around and consciously work on the body to calm the mind, uh, to influence the mind, to help us manage moods, emotions better, is really a wonderful discovery and uh, such an important self-care tool. So what are the practical implications of this? What are some of the simple things people can do to help calm the mind, help calm the body by focusing on breathing? Uh, because it's not an easy thing to do. I think we've all had the experience of trying to take a deep breath to relax, right? And getting like really, really tense. Um, if you try to force yourself to breathe deeply, it often has the opposite effect. So what's the trick? It does. And this is, this is one of those things where um, there's common lore uh, around how deep breathing is deep as in big, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because deep has more than one meaning, mm -hmm. right? It can be deep in the body. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be big, but most people equate deep breath with big breath. Um, and that that is the way to calm yourself down if or help somebody else calm down is to tell them to take a deep breath. And it's so... It's just part of, it's, it's, it, it rolls off our tongue. You said it just a little while ago, right? Right. Just take a deep breath. Um, right, right. Every yoga conference I've ever been to, mm -hmm. presenters start with that. And I'm just like, right. oh, I, okay. So um, <laughs> the reason why that works, right, is because, first of all, it puts our attention on the breath. Mm -hmm. And secondly, in the process of why it can work, let's say, um, uh, it puts our attention on the breath so that for a moment it takes it away from whatever might be agitating us or causing the anxiety, right? Um, people tend to breathe a little bit slower when they do that, and slowing the breath down has definitely been shown to have a very positive effect on the parasympathetic nervous system, of which the vagus is a very important part of, of, of its function. So uh, it brings the heart rate down. So it has a positive short-term effect in terms of that. Um, why it doesn't work in the long run is that it tends to cause us to breathe bigger. And in terms of prana and this idea of we want to preserve our prana and preserve that which we produce that enables us to oxygenate better, mm -hmm. i.e. CO2, we actually have to breathe lighter and less and not do in particular, those big sighs, which are often given as the sort of, you know, 
that's that's the go-to. Take a big right, right, right. right. Um, which actually, if one is already on the edge with hyperventilation, it's going to push you into hyperventilation, and which the mm. definition of hyperventilation is. Uh, not uh, is breathing more than our metabolic production of CO2. So mm -hmm. it's directly related to what I'm talking about with the CO2. So, and that's not, that's, that is in itself a precursor to anxiety and panic. So when you have somebody who's got anxiety, panic, asthma, something like that, and you tell them, because they're always just on the cusp on the edge, to breathe deep. Take a deep breath. <laughs> it can actually trigger exactly what they're trying and you're trying to help them to avoid. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not actually the best way to do it. And, and I, because of my practice, I work with a lot of these people, people with anxiety, people with panic disorder, people with asthma and other kinds of respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. And they um, inevitably, when I instruct them that they, because they're always apologizing for not being able to take a deeper breath and they phrase it as, I know I should, breathe deeper and the relief and the relaxation they re express to they feel when i inform them first of all reassure them you don't have to breathe more in fact make the breath lighter just and then put their hands on their lower rib cage so they start to get out of the chest and into their diaphragm into their belly and start to focus on breathing in fact deeper as in deeper in their body, but lighter with less effort mm -hmm. in their whole system. I can see it visibly as I watch them, their eyes relax, their jaw relaxes, muscles of their face, their chest relaxes. And there's this nice, beautiful kind of jellyfish action that happens around their lower rib cage and their belly, this lateral movement, which is healthy functional breathing. And they say, oh my God, I feel so much better. So um, we want to really start to re-examine, even though it's common and, um, and sort of the go-to, is it really efficient, effective, useful? Who would it be useful for? And who would it, in fact, um, possibly be, be contraindicated for? Mm -hmm. And 10% uh, of the population is on the edge, mm -hmm. according to okay. studies. Wow. So in terms of hyperventilation, anxiety, panic disorder. So we want to be really conscientious. A lot of those people come to yoga mm -hmm. because they're stressed. Mm -hmm. right? right, right, right. Yeah, I think it is one of the biggest disconnects in yoga between the teacher and the student. Because when um, we get trained in yoga as teachers, we get trained to tell students to do a big breath to take a big breath. Um, and when we are trained to teach pranayama, it's often in the context of counting one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And I know that I'm not alone that I, in saying that I've been to many, many pranayama classes where you end up going out more uncomfortable rather than relaxed and calm the way you typically are during yeah. a yoga class. Yeah. So how, what would you advise to a yoga teacher? What is a simple way to adjust to cueing the instructions? Because the breath is so important in yoga. Yeah. Well, of course, this is why I just wrote this book, Restoring Prana, Therapeutic Guide to Pranayama and Healing Through the Breath, specifically for yoga teachers, yoga therapists, and even other healthcare practitioners who use the breath in their work. I think that there's a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of education that needs to happen. Um, we've, uh, we've taken, I mean, and you're, you're a great source for this. You've, you and many others have really put a lot of attention on helping to up the bar in terms of uh, yoga teachers understanding how the body actually functions. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring a lot of fabulous presenters on to talk about the psoas muscle and the fascia and a variety of other parts mm -hmm. of the body and like how it actually works because there's an understanding we're asking people to do these very you know unusual unfamiliar movements and there has to be good education it's not just do this pose it's what is actually happening when we do this pose and what happens if somebody has this condition 
or that condition and we're asking them to do this pose. How do we adapt it so it's safe and actually giving them benefit? So um, I, I think that in that same way, we need to up the bar in terms of our understanding of the respiratory system and functional breathing. So it's, it's not a quick fix, the answer. I think the education is required, um, which I, I, is why I felt dharmically called to write the book um, so that there's more of these kinds of conversations that are happening. Um, the short version of it is um, keep your mouth closed become a 24 seven nose breather. And if you're sitting there listening and thinking, well, I'm not a mouth breather. Yeah, well, I didn't think I was either. And I was, and I was an over breather and I was an over talker. And I'm much more, um, if you think about talking and mouth open as a huge pranic leak, probably the number one pranic leak, um, think about it like that and seal the leak. Mm -hmm. Nose is, has, in terms of the other systems of the body, the nose is, the, is our defense system, our immune system's first line of defense. Mm -hmm. So we want to use the nose for that reason. Also, the nose is fascially connected to the diaphragm. And when we nose breathe, we're more likely to abdominal diaphragmatically breathe than if we breathe through our mouth, which will go more into chest breathing because mouth breathing is a backup for when we're running from the lion. That's when, in terms of our wiring, mm -hmm. when we are intended to mouth breathe is when we're doing something really big load, you know, running hard, running either for the food or away from the prey. And so it's connected to our sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So with regards to the vagus and prana and everything else, nose breathing, that's number one, become mm -hmm. a nose breather. Um, put your finger underneath your nose. This is a very old Vedic tool to use. Mm. If you can feel your breath, lighten it up. Breathe so light that you can barely feel the breath leaving. That's, That's nice a great one. way to conserve your prana. Mm -hmm. And then on the biomechanical side, if you place your hands on your lower rib cage, and your upper belly. And I did that little jellyfish movement, like you're expanding. And think of the chest staying completely passive. When we're sitting here like this, we're not running from the lion. There's absolutely no reason for the accessory muscles of the chest and the neck to be engaged during breathing. Absolutely none. And hyperinflation of the chest is linked to deoxygenation, it requires a lot more oxygen to engage those muscles and sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep the chest passive and just really activate the abdominals hugging in on the exhale and gently expanding out on the inhale. And it's a very light movement, but it's a lateral movement, not up and down. Mm -hmm. So nose breathe, light breathe, low breathe, and slow breathe. <laughs> um, now your book is coming out in December, I believe. Yes. Um, we're also really excited because you're giving a course on your review online, which is a preview of the book and then some, because you'll have some practical um, yes. advice and practices that people can do. And you're also going to go more deeply into the material that yes. we've covered here. Could you give us a preview of the course and what you'll be covering? So I'll be, um, I'm using a lot of visuals for this because uh, I think, first of all, I'm a very visual person. I think a lot of people are visual learners. They, it's, we can talk about how all the systems come together in the, around the diaphragm, but it, without the picture, it doesn't really flush it out. So I spent right. quite a bit of time. I had fun. I'm sort of creative that way. I like, I like to play with, with the, the, the images. So I, I actually created a lot of images that isolate the different systems in relationship to the diaphragm and did this nice 3D video of the diaphragm. So you really get a sense, at least I'm hoping that the viewer will get a sense of how big it is, how much space it takes up and, and its interplay with the other systems of the body. And mm -hmm. then I'll be laying out some of the scientific research that has um, demonstrated how 
important functional breathing is to the function of the cardiovascular system and the digestive system, immune system, urinary system, and on and on, musculoskeletal system. So the first um, half of the webinar will be discussing more of the diaphragm in relationship to, to the other systems. And in the second half, talking about specifically the biomechanics um, and the work of, of, of it as a primary stabilizer in the body and the studies around that. And then the practices will be very much about helping um, uh, the participants to work with and really develop their diaphragm and mm -hmm. their abdominal core. It's very much, mm -hmm. and you know what, it's the yogis, again, they got it. Bandhas are all about this. The bandha, we're working with the bandha muscles, so I'll be reviewing those and talking about those because it's, they were intentionally working synergistically together. And the bandhas are where the biomechanics and the biochemistry come together because the engagement of the core muscles and the freezing in essence of the diaphragm in its contracted position allowed for longer breath holds, which allowed for more, um, an increase in CO2 levels in the body, which allowed for deep states of meditation and, um, and the samadhi. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, I want to be sure we get to some of the questions and everyone listening okay. in, if you have questions, uh, you can, if you're on Zoom, you can type them in the Q&A box. And if you're on Facebook, you can put them in the comments section. Um, we got a couple here. Mary is saying, uh, hyperoxygenation of the upper chest. Does this mean people who are chest breathers only, or are you saying that in normal healthy breathing, we ought to not be engaging the chest muscles at all? Yes. So I just want to um, clarify a term. Um, so it's not hyperoxygenation, it's hyperinflation. Hyperinflation of the chest, hyperinflation of the lungs is actually a condition um, that's uh, most commonly uh, associated with COPD. It's not a healthy state at all. Um, and if you look at people with COPD, they have super inflated chests. They've got like this big barrel chest because their, their, their accessory chest muscles are overdeveloped because they're struggling trying to get breath in and breath out. And that's a different condition. That's an unhealthy condition, but we don't want to replicate that. Um, so what I am saying is that if we are not, if we are simply um, in a relaxed state or taking a gentle stroll or just doing our regular daily activities, sitting at a computer or, or um, hanging out with our friends, um, reading a book, our chest should be completely passive while we're breathing. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no need to be breathing. And if you catch yourself doing big sighs like every, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's an indication that you're a chronic hyperventilator. Mm -hmm. So you want to be observing that and help starting to get your breathing actually more contained and quiet. Right. And let's see, Virginia is saying, uh, what about cyclists who are breathing a lot through the mouth? Is this yeah. okay? So um, it's interesting in terms of sports performance. Um, uh, a lot of the, the breath experts that I work with train professional athletes, elite athletes, and teach them, re, they do breath re-education with them because uh, they're often told, in fact, to breathe through their mouth. Um, it's, it's not as efficient. Um, it, you, when we're changing, when we're working with the breath, we're actually changing the blood gas ratio, and that takes some time for the body and the brain to acclimate to. Mm -hmm. So it's not an overnight process. There's actually a retraining process that happens, but when professional athletes are retrained to become nose breathers, as opposed to mouth breathers, two things happen. One thing is that their performance goes up by a significant amount, and their sense of the strenuousness, their internal felt sense of how strenuous or how much effort they're putting out goes down. And my personal experience is exactly that. I exercise much harder and much longer now than I ever was able to before. And I do all of my cardio and all my weights, weight practices, um, my yoga practice, my walking, everything with my mouth closed. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And I bike, I bike as well. 
let's see here. Angela is asking, is your book available December 2019? Yes. Okay, great. And Deborah, um, can shoulder pain be altered by changing the breath in the upper chest? Um, she's probably talking about the alignment trick you were talking about. Not, well, actually, Eva, is it okay if I plug my last webinar? Yeah. Deborah, I recommend that yes, absolutely, and all the information that I have to share on that, um, I, I, I actually, I, it's, a, it's a great companion to the webinar that I'm, I'm doing at the end of the month, but it's on relieving neck and shoulder pain, and the first thing I talk about is that chronic chest breathing is very much connected to um, neck and shoulder pain, and that until one shifts to become an abdominal diaphragmatic breather, it's unlikely, I mean, you can stretch, you can strengthen, you can do all kinds of muscular movements in your upper body, but if 15, 20,000 times you're tensing your shoulders with every single breath, it's unlikely that the chronic tension is going to go away. Mm -hmm. So the breath is definitely a big piece of that, mm -hmm. that um, yeah, unwinding point. process. Um, and Lizzie Marilyn is asking, how does this relate to yoga and cues to breathe audibly? Are we talking oh, about yes. Breathing? Well, it relates totally to how we cue for breathing. And this is, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It, it was definitely a big transition for me in terms of how I taught the breath. Um, so one of, the, one of my primary, I, I use the term slow and low a lot. I have people do this throughout the practice so they can, you know, gauge it themselves, particularly after a more challenging sequence where respiratory rate goes up, heart rate goes up. And then I talk a lot about settling the breath and I have them bring their hands low on their body, you know, like down around their rib cage and their abdominals and get back into the low, slow pattern so that as they're, as they're working more, they learn to breathe lighter and build up their endurance and capacity to do that. Um, so low and slow, I also say, if you can hear yourself breathe, you're breathing too much. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, well, I'm kind of going through the questions here fast because there's a lot coming in. Um, Anne is saying, is lower back pain affected by how you breathe? Absolutely, absolutely. And again, there's, there's multiple studies that support this and uh, I will be citing those in, um, in the webinar. And I actually have, I think, three pages of, of references that I'm including in the webinar at the end so that people can follow up and, and do more research mm, on this. But absolutely, because if the core muscle, core isn't engaged um, be, you know, due to chest breathing, then it leaves the lumbar area and sacrum also very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dana is saying, uh, when I rinse my sinuses, I'm always calmer and happier afterwards. I have never <laughs> heard anybody say this, but based on absolutely. what you're saying, it makes sense. Yes. Yes, absolutely. When people are chronically congested. So it's, it's, it's un unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle. People who have chronic congestion tend to mouth breathe. And the more you breathe through your mouth, the stuffier you will become. And I, 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 another, I did the the webinar with you a year and a half ago, maybe on the healing power of breath, where I talked more about the biochemistry of breathing. Um, but so there's more information about that. But essentially, um, if you, unless you clear your nose and are able to use it, you're going to maintain, you're going to constantly have that post nasal drip and the congestion. Mm -hmm. So in order to become a nose breather, you have to use your nose. And in order to use your nose, you have to have it be clear. So Keep using your neti pot, but use some nausea oil afterwards so it's your sinuses and your, your nasal cavity doesn't get all dried out. Mm. Please. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Angela is asking, uh, actually there was another one before that. Uh, Julie is asking, do the pelvic floor muscles echo the diaphragm movement? Yeah, they kind of work, the diaphragm kind of works like a piston. Um, uh, uh, to, with, the, with the pelvic floor. So they do work synergistically together. When, when I mean, that's, that's how it's naturally wired. However, 
life happens and we can become chest breathers and disconnect from our core and our pelvic floor muscles can be not activated really much at all. And there's a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction and you've had some wonderful speakers on, on yoga, you talking about the importance of the pelvic floor. Again, you can't talk about the pelvic floor without talking about diaphragm and breathing because they're very much connected. Connected. Yes. And Elizabeth is asking, uh, or she's commenting, quoting you, if you can hear yourself breathe, you're breathing too hard. And she says, how does this relate to ujjayi breath? Yeah, you know, ujjayi breath is a very wonderful technique when it's understood. Um, so uh, all of the pranayama techniques are, in essence, ways of reducing the breath reducing, like if you think one nostril is less than two, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of the nostril techniques have to do with reducing the breath, reducing the flow. Okay. So it's all about breathing less, not more. And ujjayi, what is happening is you're creating a, a smaller valve through which the breath is flowing in the back of the throat. It's much like this, but in the back of the throat. And both of these also increase nasal resistance or resistance, which is a positive thing because it, it, it's like narrowing the funnel so it's more concentrated. And when we create that resistance with ujjayi, it actually um, helps with activation of the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So the muscular action is very useful. There's nothing, honestly, promise me, I've read as many of the texts as I can put my hands on. Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the Garanta Samhita, the Yoga Rahasya, none of them say big sound is a part of Ujjayi. Good point. It's not about the bigger the sound. Right, right. One can actually do Ujjayi and hardly make any sound at all. Right, right. Yeah. Good point. Uh, last question here from Marnie. What about breath work, holotropic breath work? in particular, I've experienced what seems like aggressive breath work and it becomes very really uncomfortable. Yes, so holotropic breath work, which I've actually done in a past life many years ago, and I had this amazing hallucinatory experience. It was like being on LSD or something. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I mean, it was kind of cool. Um, however, I, it, it's, it's a state of severe hyperventilation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of negative health uh, conditions that go along with hyperventilation. It's not something I recommend for people um, on a regular basis. And for anybody who's already on the border with that, with anxiety, depression, anybody who's got a lot of inflammation in their system already, because um, CO2 is very much an antioxidant in terms of helping our body to fight free radicals and bring inflammation down. So anybody who's on the edge with any of those kinds of health conditions, I do not recommend that kind of breathing. And mm -hmm. that, that kind of ties into the way in which Kapalabhati and Bastrika are used, again, which are not necessarily the way that they were intended, um, which is a big subject, but I just want to put that out there. Um, mm -hmm. Hyperventilation, intentional volitional hyperventilation for most people um, on a regular basis is going to deplete prana rather than build prana. Interesting, interesting. And last, before we close, I just want to uh, also make a comment of how um, you're talking about one of the focuses and the practices you make for the course you're working on for your review online is strengthening diaphragm. Yes. And I find it really interesting that one of the leading causes of death when people get older is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Yeah. Yeah. And it's some, you know, we, we know that the muscles get weaker as we get older and we work a lot with strength training to make sure our muscles stay functional. But in that picture, we never really focus on the diaphragm. So my question to you, is there a link between this high incidence of COPD um, when people get older as a cause of death and the fact that the diaphragm gets weaker with time and we don't really do anything to keep it strong? Um, you know, so I can't speak from on a scientific basis because I haven't read the research and even if there is any research specifically on that. So I'm just going on based on what I do know and understand and what I've observed. Um, 
uh, first of all, two things. One thing is that older people tend to move less. When we move less, we're producing less CO2. Older people tend to mouth breathe. My mom spent seven years in a, in a, in a, a nursing home um, and she had Alzheimer's and um, almost all of the people in that space, I mean, first of all, they weren't breathing much, I mean, moving much, but they also mouth breathing, very, very mm -hmm. high incidence if you look at older people. So you've got people who are moving less and mouth breathing um, and so they're likely chest breathing, diaphragm is getting less activated, less CO2 production. So both on the biomechanical and biochemical levels, their prana is depleting. Mm, yeah. And then of course their heart isn't getting pumped, right? And their vital organs aren't getting pumped. So the circulatory system isn't getting pumped. All of that, all of and that. You're sitting in this of heart failure where the lungs fill with mm -hmm. fluid and that where do they fill from the bottom, right where the diaphragm is. Right, right. Yeah, and the slump position doesn't help either. Of then. course, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, so Robin, a very, very warm thank you to you for joining us today and yeah. sharing of all your insights. We could keep you here for hours and hours. Um, Just wait, and the book's coming out. Also, I'll be offering some Restoring Prana workshops um, uh, over this next year for those who are interested in, in getting a jump start on this and actual putting it into practical application. And so keep posted on my website for those. Yes, and we're very much looking forward to your online course. So it's two lectures and then a practice uh, yes. focusing on, on these things, and that's coming up pretty soon. Um, very good in a, about a week and a half yeah so um everyone listening in thank you so much for joining us we will be posting a link to the recording so if you missed parts of this <laughs> um you will be able to catch it in the recording and um if you want us to send the recording so you can download it uh be sure to uh, sign up for it. Also in the comment section below, we'll post a link to where you can sign up for getting the recording with the full session. And if so, you feel like this was informative for you, please share it with your yoga colleagues so that um, other teachers in the community get this information. This is, this is so critical in terms of what we do as yoga teachers. And so I think it's just important that we're educated and that we help our, our whole profession as teachers and therapists to grow and develop um, as this kind of information comes forward. Yes, very true. And let's see, we're getting some accolades here. Uh, Colette is saying, thank you. I will be breathing through the nose from now on. Yeah. And Alyssa is saying, Robin, that was wonderful. Thank you. Deborah is saying, um, could you please send a link for the other workshop you mentioned? We appreciated the talk. Dana saying, thank you, Robin. I will start using nausea oil. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. And BJ is saying, thank you. This was very important and enlightening. Great. So everyone, so again, thank you so much for joining us. And Robin, a very warm thank you to you for sharing your time. And thank you, Eva, for giving me this opportunity. Yes, it's our pleasure. And we'll see you soon online again. Take care. Bye-bye. Blessings. Namaste.